this uh, is a, uh, a really interesting um, implementation of new technology. Um, and I'm not going to tell you about it. I'm going to let Jeff Cardenas, the co-founder and CEO of Aptronic, tell you about the convergence of AI and humanoid robots. Welcome, Jeff. All right, so this should be a little different of a talk for the afternoon. Uh, first, thank you guys for having me here. My name is Jeff Cardenas, and I'm the co-founder and CEO uh, of a company based in Austin, Texas, called Abtronic. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you guys about today, this is really just educational to give you guys an idea about what's happening in robotics and in AI and how generative AI is really intersecting with robotics as a whole. And we're gonna really walk through the journey of robotics and how it um, is evolving and really we're experiencing some big changes across the industry as a whole. Uh, but first, a little background on Abtronic and, and where all this came from. So Abtronic got its roots in the University of Texas at Austin. I started the company with a friend of mine and a professor uh, coming out of a lab called the Human Centered Robotics Lab. And in the lab, our roots were working with NASA Johnson Space Center on the robot you see here in the middle, a robot called Valkyrie. And it's a really interesting story in terms of how Valkyrie came about and really the roots of the modern robotic industry as a whole. So it really happened in the wake of, of the Fukushima disaster. Uh, the, the reactors were melting down and we needed, it was not safe for humans to go in and so it was very clear we need to send a robot in. The challenge was that robots could largely only do one task. So we needed a robot to go down the, down the stairs, we needed a robot that could open doors, turn valves, do a whole variety of different things and robots could largely only do one of those tasks. And in the wake of that, DARPA really sort of uh, made a big focus to say we should have much more general purpose robots initially for disaster recovery. So they started something called the DARPA Robotics Challenge and the goal was to build a superhero robot that could help, um, help humans in these natural disaster responses. And this was really the big break for a lot of folks in robotics because this had been the dream for a long time and it was the first time there was really funding to make this happen. But we'd started with, you know, this was a $5 million robot. Uh, you know, it was literally gold anodized NASA hardware. And our goal was to get to a sub $50,000 mass manufacturable humanoid robot that could go from the lab out into the real world. And it turns out that is much easier said than done. Uh, we, we did not know what we were biting off, and maybe that was for the best. Um, but now here we are today, we have 125 employees. We're working with folks like Mercedes and GXO and a whole host of others uh, to get these robots out into the world. And I'll talk a little bit about that as I go through this. The simplest way to think about this, my early pitch was today we have thousands of robots that do one thing. The future looks like one robot that can do thousands of different things. And when you see something like a humanoid robot with all the science fiction, this seems like a, you know, sort of a crazy idea. But we've gone through this before. We've also gone through the same fears that we have today about robotics before, and that happened in computing. So if you look even prior to this graph here, back in the 1950s, a computer looked like you know, 100 people sitting in a room doing hand calculations. It's a big step forward once we had the mainframe computer. It's somewhat more versatile than sort of special purpose computers, think calculator or something like that. Um, and, and, and so we, we went from the mainframe into the personal computer. And the personal computer was this breakout moment for computing where uh, it was much more accessible to the population as a whole. So a wider variety of people could actually adopt and use these uh, devices. And if you sort of take that analogy, we're in that same moment in robotics. We're in the personal computer moment. Where I think of industrial robots today as mainframe computers, they're somewhat versatile, they're clunky, only a handful of folks can actually adopt them, and we're about to enter the PC era where robotics will really scale to the masses into a whole range of different applications, and I think humanoid robots are what will really lead the charge. So if you take that analogy, why the humanoid robot, why the humanoid form factor, why not any other form factor overall? The idea is simple, which is the world is built for humans. And so if you want a robotic system that can actually scale into our environment such that it can still be optimized for the human, then the humanoid form factor makes a lot of sense. Today, roughly three to six X the price of a robot is spent just integrating it into a workflow. 
So these robots are very dumb, they're very limited in what they can do, so we have to change the process to make way for the robot. What we want to do is just slot a robot in, it can do work the way that we do it in the environment we're doing it, and that really changes the game for robotics adoption, reduces the friction overall. The second reason is if you look at where robotics is applied today, it's very narrow because the economics only work out if you can run a robot for, let's say, 8 to 16 hours a day minimum. If you look at things like in your operations in manufacturing, we're running these robots 24 hours a day. So the ability to task switch becomes really important. I can do this task for two hours, I can do the next task for four hours, I can switch, that changes the economics. But that's heavily tied to the first point, which is I can't change the environment every time I change the task, so the ability to have a multi-purpose robot is heavily tied to the ability to retrofit that robot into the world that is built for us. The third reason, which is really gonna be the focus of my talk today, is about how AI plays into all of this. And the simple way of thinking about this is as we have these new generative AI models, in robotics you'll hear them called foundation models, if we can create tokens out of human language, why can't we do the same thing out of human movement? And for many things, humanoid robots were much more complicated. It's more motors than a traditional robot, more sensing. I'll talk a little bit about that. But when it turns out when you're applying generative AI, they're actually much more straightforward. We can actually train with big data sets of humans doing tasks and directly apply that onto a robot that's doing tasks in the same way we do it. And that's creating a massive tailwind overall. All right, so I wanted to walk folks through the history of robotics here. So we had the first industrial robot was introduced in 1961. It's called the Unimate Arm. Um, it was introduced in a General Motors factory uh, here in the US. The first mobile robot was in 1970. It was a robot called Shaky. And then, you know, it's interesting, if you trace back humanoid robots as a whole, humans have been trying to do this for thousands of years. The first humanoid robot was recorded in, I think it's like 300 BC in China, an automata. This idea that could we build a tool for ourselves that could do all the things that we don't want to do so that we can spend the time the way we do want to spend it uh, has been around for a long time, but the technology hasn't been there. So you can see the early roots of actually having some of the technology capabilities. But then as I mentioned, it was the DARPA Robotics Challenge that really started to put all of this together to actually make it feasible. We had a big moment in the industry and as a company last year when we introduced our first robot, a robot called Apollo. So the robot you see here in this video is our eighth iteration of humanoid robot. We've done 40 iterations of electric motors. This is sort of the building block that allows you to build a mass manufacturable robot. It's five foot eight, weighs 160 pounds. It operates with swappable batteries so you can continuously keep it going. And it lifts about 55 pounds. So it's normal body mass index and it's targeted for mass manufacturability and affordability overall. And this was really sort of a step change and this is the very beginning. So if you take my analogy for personal computers, Think of this as the personal computer in the early 80s. And this is the shift, right? We're, we're moving from special purpose robots that are very limited, that are not safe to be around humans, that are difficult to program, into this new world of general purpose robots that are safe to be around, that are adaptable, that can communicate with us in a variety of different ways, and that really changes everything overall. But how does that happen, and what is driving that? So I have a bit of an anatomy here of the robot overall. You could think of really as two things that we want a robot to do. Mobility, move around the world, and manipulation, the ability to manipulate and interact with the world. And then you have the software that sits on top of that overall. This looks complicated when you put this together, and, and it actually turns out it is fairly complicated, um, <laughs> uh, as, I, as I've learned along the way. Um, but it's really simple when you think about it. Think of this just like the smartphone where, you know, there's like this video, there's this picture from back in the 90s where they have the video camera and they have a VCR and a TV and all these different electrical devices that then go into one device, a single device you can carry in your pocket. This is what's happening in AI and in the physical world, right? All of these disparate systems that we've had, smart computer vision systems, a variety of different types of robots, different types of compute, GPUs, CPUs, it's all gonna come together into my view, the ultimate form factor that allows us to do a whole host of different things. All right, so I talked about this idea of generative AI and how it intersects with robotics. 
The, another sort of simple analogy of thinking about this is the next big wave in AI is the shift in the translation from the digital world where the computer is stuck, you know, trapped behind a piece of glass into the physical world. And so how are we doing that? So I mentioned the idea that we can create tokens out of human language and we can do the same thing out of human movement. How do we do that? Well, the holy grail for us is to do that from video. So we want to be able to show a robot what to do once and the robot can do it. That's called zero-shot learning. But the way that we're bootstrapping our policies today is doing something called teleoperation. So we remotely control the robot in task, in a situation, and we collect a variety of instances of teleoperating the robot. We can use that to build massive data sets, which then we combine with other data sets as well to get the robots doing uh, a variety of different autonomous tasks. The videos that you see here is work that we did with NVIDIA. We've also done this work internally and a variety of others, but you've heard a lot of talk with Jensen and talking about their new foundation model called Groot for all the same reasons that I'm talking about uh, here today. The big question, I think, from a lot of people is, why, why do you have to do that in the physical world? Why can't you do that actually in the uh, digital world? It's very expensive to scale teleoperation. And the short answer is you can do it in the digital world, but our simulation is not good enough yet to fully simulate what happens in reality. So we combine this teleoperation happening on the robot with simulation, and the, the output video should show a real robot. I'm not sure what happened to the slide here. Uh, but we can run things in simulation, simple things like locomotion, and we can apply that and put that together. And what we're doing then overall is we're starting to build data sets of a variety of different skills which we can stitch together over time um, to do a whole host of different tasks. And that's really the holy grail and the promise and the, the beginning of all of this overall. And like I said, where we're going is you show the robot what to do and the robot can do a whole variety and host of different tasks. Um, and that is a big vision uh, of where these robots go overall, and so you gotta start somewhere. And so I wanted to sort of close out here by talking about how I see the market evolving over time. Because the question I always get is, when is this thing gonna do my laundry? Which, you know, I'm, I'm working on that. I promise I, I want laundry and dishes as well. Um, but that's an even bigger challenge. There's a high degree of variability in the home. And the, the simple way of thinking about it is we're moving what we call in robotics structured applications to increasingly unstructured. So structured means the environment is predictable. We can control that environment in some way. We can control the task in some way. And then we're moving to unstructured. So think of the bookends of automation where I showed you we started with a robot in the factory back in the 60s. Think of the holy grail is going to the home and to everybody's home. And for me personally, what got me into all of this, the holy grail for me is robots for elder care, a robot that can help uh, take care, hopefully, of my parents as they get older, take care of me. Uh, and I think that's sort of the objectively good future where this will go. Humans are tool makers, and we can now build tools for ourselves that enable us to do much more than ever before. And now that's moving from being confined to the digital world into the physical world. And we want to continue to have a world that is built for all of us. These are some of the applications just to get down to the brass tacks of like where you're going to see these robots in the near future. Based on that sort of market paradigm, where the market opportunity sort of meets the technology readiness is in critical industries where we have massive labor shortages. I think you guys all experienced this in your business, but the world experienced this during COVID. We have major labor shortages across our critical industries, particularly in manufacturing and logistics. And so uh, there's big opportunities and a big need and somewhat structured applications where we can get fleets of these robots out to start doing data collection. So it's the beginning uh, of this journey, and it's really exciting to think about where this goes the next 10 years from now. Um, but I really appreciate you guys taking the time and look forward to seeing where all this goes. Thank you very much.